Well, let's just jump right in then. Um, so I was hoping, first of all, you could tell us a little bit about the Zoom workarounds that you found helpful for online teaching and then maybe a little bit about the microphone setups that you know to be working. Okay. Well, so when the pandemic started, we were all scrambling. And luckily, I had some things in place and then got some tutoring from the music engineering folks at the Frost School of Music. So this is my Rode NT4 stereo microphone. This is my PreSonus AudioBox i2 interface. It's super important that for Zoom lessons that people use an Ethernet cable. Unfortunately, Macs don't come with an Ethernet port, and so you have to buy a cable. It's very, very important though, because without it, you have very high latency, and that causes problems with um, getting the audio and the video to match up. Here is my little Jake microphone that's in bore on my Wolf vocal. And from that, I go into a preamp that comes with the little, the little Jake. It's in an Altoids box that I have put gaffer tape over so it doesn't look an Altoid box when I'm on stage. And then I go into my iRig Pro that allows the audio signal from my guitar cable to go into the iRig Pro. And from there, I go into my iPad where I have Tone Stack Go set up with all my pedals for the various movements of the pieces I'm playing. And I can quickly change um, pieces and get my new setup in between movements. And these are my Grado headphones that I use for um, playing along with my multi-track recordings. So, you know, I think by now everybody knows about turn on original sound and zoom and all that, but it still doesn't really play great. It doesn't really play nice with bassoon, even when you do that. It, it, it does pretty well with an interface and a microphone, and it's very acceptable. But through just my own sleuthing and being on a technology committee, I found two other workarounds that I think sound better. Um, the first one and the easiest one is if your students have a good DAW, a digital um, audio workstation, preferably they have a Mac so they have GarageBand already on it and they're all, all set, or if they have Logic. Um, you can actually set your output in your DAW to, be, to go right into Zoom and then mute your Zoom audio so that you're only getting the audio process through the DAW. The drawback to that is uh, you have to do input monitoring on the track, which I'll, I'll show you all this, and the student would then hear themselves in their headphones. So they, that's another reason you want a interface because then I have manual control mm -hmm. over how loud I'm hearing myself in the headphones. Okay, so there's a couple of, couple of situations you can do, and one is to just circumvent Zoom's audio altogether. So you go to Logic, and you go to your audio preferences. It says top left, and this is Logic, GarageBand. It doesn't matter what DAW you are in. Any DAW that has that you can change your audio preferences to Zoom audio device, you're fine. And you have to be screen sharing or sharing audio to do this. So you first would either share audio from your computer with the advanced settings or share your screen altogether. This is the, really the student is the one who needs to do this. And so then you go to your um, preferences, audio, and I'm going to change my output from my interface. My output device is now going to go to Zoom audio device, and my input device I need to change back to my interface because I still need my microphone going into um, Logic. But I need my output going to Zoom. So now I'm going to apply the changes. Okay, and as soon as the, this, this, there you go. There you go. Now are you, now are you you're hearing, you're hearing sort of an echo, of an echo now, right? right? Yes. Okay. So now, so I've, got now I've got to come back to Zoom and kill, and kill Zoom. Zoom. I'm, muting I'm muting Zoom. Zoom. Now you're hopefully only hearing one audio signal, right? Yes. So mm -hmm. 
you're now hearing what would be going into logic unfiltered as opposed to zoom even with its turn on original sound messing with it so let's do a demonstration i'm going to um go back to zoom for a second so let's just play you know an f major scale no let's do a b flat because i find low b flats the really terrible scale on um the low b flats the worst thing on zoom should sound pretty good because we're using original sound and we're using this nice microphone interface but it's still zoomy so we're gonna get rid of being zoomy by screen sharing again okay, okay. Uh, uh, now, now we, we gotta, gotta come back because you, you hear me twice, twice. Let, let me mute, mute zoom. zoom all right now the only audio you're hearing is from logic <laughs> That's incredible. It's better, right? Yes. Okay. So what you're doing is you're just cutting Zoom out of the equation. You're going to use Zoom for video, and you're going to use your DAW for the audio. The thing you're going to run into is there's often a lag. I have a student uh, on the West Coast that I teach, and when this student does this technique, they lag behind. So I can see them play first. Sorry, I hear them play first, and then I see the movement. But really, what are we trying to get out of lessons? I want the best possible audio. And then if I really need to observe something, I still with camera angles can observe it. Now, let me stop this and show you something else. So the student need, doesn't need to share their logic session. They can simply hit share screen and go to advanced and say music or computer sound only. Click on that, hmm. share. Now, now mute, mute zoom. zoom. Now they have the regular video experience without the two screens blocking, but you're still hearing me from Logic. Uh, the other thing I was going to say is students really need these. I have open back headphones. These are Grados, which is one of the great companies. Uh, they're, I think they're in Brooklyn, New York, and they're handmade. Uh, these are only like a couple hundred bucks. It's not so much that they need Grados, they need open backed. Because if you're going to play bassoon in a lesson with headphones on, you guys know what that's like. Like, I have those same headphones, Laura. You, those, those are the awesome Sony ones, right? That you have? Yeah. Yeah, those are great. But if you try to play bassoon with those on, oh, you can't. It sounds like you're, it's like when you're, I don't know, you're trying to like eat potato chips with your ears plugged or something. <laughs> you know? Um, so, open back headphones allow me to hear I can hear my hands you know I can rub my fingers together and hear it like it's normal so I can actually hear my real bassoon sound and then also get the audio for them then playing to me over this workaround they're gonna have to turn in turn their input monitoring down um, mm -hmm. because they have to select input monitoring on their track or that workaround won't work you can't just pull up a track and start recording or it'll just sound it'll just be mute. They have to click input monitoring, which means they can hear it as it's played. And I was also hoping you might tell us a little bit about your CD that's coming up. Thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> so um, you asked me about microphone setups. So I've learned a lot about microphones, um, about how to interact with them in a different way than I had before through this CD that's coming out August 1st. Uh, it's called Swagger for amplified bassoon and uh, various chamber music accompaniment. So that is coming up. And it's all uh, the first three pieces are amplified bassoon. The Swagger does not have digital effects. The swagger is just amplified. Miracle Blasco and Behold a Pale Horse have like guitar pedal style effects. And then Quintantino is not um, amplified. It just uses a lot of extended techniques that kind of sound amplified. Multiphonics and 
kind of hmm. distorted, hard hits, tongue slap, not really tongue slap, something that Paul calls brassy effect. He got it from Pascal Galois' book. Um, so in that recording of that, it's the first time I've done an album where I recorded close. I've always, when I did my own projects, did classical style with an array out in the hall, and you hear what I sound like 25 feet away, and you balance everything um, naturally, like you would a rehearsal. The conductor says, play that again, and you do this, or the producer's like, oh, that was a little too loud. That's not the way, we did this is all studio style, where the microphones are right here. And so I learned a lot about how that you do need a closer mic and pick reads and things that you like the way they sound up close, which is so different. But to that end, I also recorded uh, three pieces that are amplified. So we captured both the up clo close acoustic sound and we captured the sound from one of these little Jake setups that Trent Jacobs invented and made and has sold. And that way we had the best of both worlds in post-production. We had the clean signal out of the bassoon and we had the acoustic sound of the bassoon and you could mix uh, from the two. And I also recorded all the effects in real time from my iPad. I do something a little different than other folks. I use an iPad. I don't use actual physical pedals. And one of the pieces, Behold a Pale Horse, is uh, what you hear on that recording is all the pedal effects out of my iPad. Miracle of Lasco, because of the way we captured it, we had a little signal noise we were able to kill the effects that I recorded then. And then in post-production, add the effects back because um, we needed a clean signal. Because I captured the acoustic signal, I captured a clean signal of the vocal, and I captured the iPad signal. So we had a bunch to jump back and forth from. As you see, all my pedals are in here for the different movements. Um, and I can... This is the coup de grace movement and Brett beats his piece. And, you know, I just played around with these pedals till I found a sound that I thought sounded like the music that he wanted. He gave me um, free reign to pick the pedals on each uh, movement. So pedals, and it lets you simulate the, the amplifier head and the cabinet and all that. And so this is the little coup de grace movement um, effects that I chose. Awesome. <laughs> And, you know, there's even a, and I have all my presets saved for live performance on stage so I can quickly uh, switch between the movements. Um, there we go, the, the screen share is catching up. So if I want to play the middle movement with distortion, I can go to silent and I can play it live. Head banger, pedal ready to go, and this is the actual setup. I will play as soon as we catch it up. Which, which app did you, or did you say you're running that through? That's called Tone Stack Go. But the cool Tone thing Stack. is, is that, you know, Logic and GarageBand have pedals you can drop in too. And right. you can actually use a pre sewn like one of these interfaces to do the same thing. Instead of plugging into the iRig, which is just a simple little interface, I could plug straight into a Presonus in your interface because they were made to accept guitar cables and use something like MainStage or one of the other mm -hmm. things. What I, the reason I got into using software pedals is they're cheaper. I can yeah. buy a pedal for $5 that simulates a real pedal in the real world. In some cases, they even license the name of the pedal from the company that made the original. And I have all these things available, whereas if I had to buy all these pedals in real real life. It's, I mean, it's pretty I, substantial. I started experimenting with some of this too, and I'm using uh, just Jam Up. Jam like the, Up. Yeah, Jam Up, and there's a pro version that has, it looks exceptionally similar, but I have like a, I don't have the, the little Jake stuff installed just yet, but I'm using just one of those cord clip-on, it looks like you've got set up over there mm -hmm. with a, a microphone splitter, mm -hmm. and I'm able to get the, the pickup 
mic clipped onto the vocal in through the app, through the, the headphone jack, and then export the rest of it, you know, it splits and sends it out to my headphones. And I'm just sort of, you know, experimenting with some of it. So there are, I think, some ways definitely, you know, to have a, an affordable experimentation before you invest in some of this big, you know, this big technology. This was like a, it's like a $5 app. And then a, I think the Korg pickup came with my Korg metronome from, you know, whenever I got it in high school, you know, it's one of those little clippy and that, that you works. never use. Like I found it in a box somewhere. That's awesome. Um, but I mean, I, it wouldn't work for very well for something where you want a high quality, true bassoon sound, right? Because it doesn't sound like a bassoon. But if I'm fundamentally going to run it through a distortion pedal and then add a whammy bar and then have all these, you know, corals, like the fact that it sort of doesn't sound like a bassoon when it goes in is kind of a pretty low on the on the priority list <laughs> for me, at least at this point. Well, what was interesting is when I recorded Swagger, the, the piece that's amplified only, the composer, we captured all of her. We captured the ambient sound and we captured the vocal sound. But the composer preferred the vocal sound. That's when I first played Amplified Bassoon for him, I played it with that setup, the, the Little Jake setup. And that's what got him excited about writing the piece. So he wanted that. Like he primarily wanted that. And the way we have always handled it in live performances, we do a lot of EQing. So we sit there and we try to get as close. And there's there's one movement in Miracle of Lascaux by Robert J. Bradshaw where it, it's not ample, it's not um, affected. The re everything else is, but the fourth movement is not. But we still use just the vocal sound and then just play with the EQ till we got a pretty bassoon sound, not my bassoon sound, but a pretty bassoon sound that did reflect the expression that I was po hopefully pouring into the instrument, but. I don't know how you feel, Kayla, but um, what I think is interesting about the whole Amplified Bassoon emergence that um, was really championed by Paul Hansen and some of those other guys, um, I feel like I spent so much time learning to play the bassoon, and I love orchestra, I love Mahler, I love, you know, anything Stravinsky, Mozart, but I always felt like, well, that's it. I mean, I have to play that music because that's what we have or we play some new music that's cool but so much was cut off to us whereas if you're your saxophone player you're playing a jazz band and i feel like to me this has opened up a new dimension for me to pour all that skill into that i worked on and that suddenly uh, all those comments about bassoon being soft and all that's irrelevant because all i got to do is turn it up well, I'm, I'm finding, I think, I wonder if this is now, because this is our second kind of interview that we have done, and this is the second time I felt compelled to bring up, but um, I think my, one of my big driving forces in terms of just my own pursuit practice and my own teaching is have, developing the control to make the sound that you want to make when you want to make it. And when you have something like this, these electronic components that are now added into the mix, you just have so many more sounds that you can make and you know it's a new it's a new challenge in a way right trying to figure out exactly and it's a different i found it really mentally kind of intellectually similar to doing long tones when i'm playing around with all these you know these eq settings and the different pedals and things because it was what do i need to do exactly at what moment and hit the pedal exactly when to make the sound that's the most effective sound even I, if I it's not like the bassoon sound that i spent years you know carving my reed to make <laughs> well, and speaking of carving reed, right? Like the sensitivity that your reed needs is kind of different. Mm -hmm. um, often you the, there is a little bit of latency, and so if your reed's not doesn't speak really fast, it's even worse. It's and, terrible if you don't. I mean, it's just soft is so hard on amplified bassoon. <laughs> you just need something that'll that'll go right. It has yeah. to go when you want it to go. And if you take the microphone off and you strip everything down, it's to my ear, it's a lot kind of flabbier and more metallic sounding Absolutely. and and a lot buzzier and a lot louder than I would play if I were just playing kind of my classically trained like my if I if I were playing my my good girl bassoon excerpts. You know, I'm <laughs> I'm using a fundamentally different setup. Yeah, and I embrace it. I mean, I'm not trying to. I think I misunderstood people who did it before me that were already doing it until I sort of fell in love with it, and then I'm like, oh yeah, I don't, I don't necessarily want to sound the same.
I want to thank you so much for doing this. This was incredibly kind of you to take your time and share your expertise with us. Um, I might ask you later on for a few links um, to share with people so maybe they can um, purchase the things that you recommend, if that's okay. Yeah, and absolutely. First, let me thank you guys for having me. It's a real pleasure. I'm honored that you're interested in what I'm doing and that the main thing is, is if we can all share our tips and tricks, we can make this difficult period, we can help keep the music going, keep mm -hmm. the music instruction going, and I, I hope this will foster a sense of sharing uh, across, um, as, as, as each of us learn some new thing that can make it better for everybody, hopefully we'll all share. It's so important for us to, to see the ways that people are making this electronic interface be real teaching, real music, something that is valuable in and of itself and not just a band-aid that we're just slapping on until we get back to what we want to do. I think this is this is very legitimate and I'm really thankful. We're both really thankful that you took the time to talk about it with us. Yeah. Thank you. Those are those are beautiful words about this, that it's really legitimate and that we're making real art in this space. I love that. I'm gonna use that. I'll quote you. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs>